thank you everyone for coming here uh, to listen to my talk um, about loneliness and social connection in a busy world. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, substitute figures and animals and how we might use them uh, to try and help combat loneliness and increase feelings of belongingness in this talk. Um, and some of the pros and cons of it, because they're definitely both them double-edged swords. And I will talk a little bit uh, generally about um, loneliness and belonging and ways to um, improve it, both proven ones and less proven ones. So I thought I'd start off our talk today just with a few um, facts about loneliness. So um, a survey done uh, last year looking at North Americans, primarily in the US, found uh, nearly 60% of Americans admitted that they were lonely. Um, a different survey, um, also in the US, uh, found 21% of Americans said they had no close friends at all. And then another survey, this one conducted across the US, the UK and Japan, found that 22% of people surveyed said they often or always felt lonely. Now, although none of those stats are Canada per se, um, actually Canadians surveyed a report of figure around the 30% mark um, of feeling lonely, uh, often, always, or some of the time. So really, we're looking at a ballpark that's quite similar. Okay, so um, traditionally we've thought about loneliness as something happening perhaps to older people. I think when you conjure up um, lonely figures, you often think of you know older people that have maybe not got so many friends, can't get around more. Um, but more recently, you've seen a bit of a trend towards um, a younger population. So another recent survey found that uh, Generation Z, and that's people born between about 97 and 2012, is actually the loneliest cohort in North America. So around 65% of Generation Z said they sometimes or always felt lonely. And we can actually compare that with baby boomers, who are people that maybe might be thinking more stereotypically, um, would feel loneliness, because um, this is not actually the case. Only about 40% of baby boomers actually reported the same levels of loneliness. So we're seeing a bit of a rising tide um, in loneliness amongst younger populations compared to previously. Okay, so why does it matter? Well, um, some more um, salutary statistics. Around 77% of adults with poor or fair physical health report feeling lonely, and 85% of adults with poor or fair mental health report being lonely. Now, although that study uh, doesn't actually uh, have any causal sort of effect in it, there is generally acknowledged uh, to be an increased risk of mortality amongst individuals who do feel lonely. So obviously it's an important health issue. Now added to that, uh, separate research has found that loneliness and isolation uh, can actually have severe negative impacts on health to the extent of uh, being similar to being obese, uh, being an alcoholic or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Okay, so um, um, the same study in fact found that loneliness, or concluded loneliness was more harmful to your health than not exercising. Okay, that's the bad news. <laughs> so, okay, traditional ways then to beat loneliness. So, some traditional methods that we've acknowledged that improve um, uh, reconnection, allow us to connect with other people, are obviously being members of clubs, uh, joining meetups, uh, checking in on neighbours has the beneficial effect of actually helping you feel more connected, but also helping your neighbours feel more connected and creating community spirit. Uh, exploring new hobbies, signing up to new skills. Some of these cost money, some of them cost nothing. It's just a matter of meeting up with people. And of course the good news about joining uh, clubs to explore hobbies that you're interested in is you're meeting people that have similar interests to you too. Uh, volunteering has a long-standing uh, connection to helping with feelings of belongingness and reducing feelings of loneliness and then engaging in more face-to-face -face interactions, which I'll come back to at the end. However, I said the title of my talk was talking about uh, substitute figures and animals. So I'm going to start with social media. Now, a lot of doing these things would be great if we all had loads of time. 
if we had time spare to go to clubs, to join all these things. So this is part of the problem, isn't it? Is that we often are time poor at the same time as wanting more social connections. So not surprisingly, a lot of people turn to social media because it's more convenient. So um, that's obviously not coincidental. In fact, you know, the CEO of Facebook actually talked about the whole purpose of Facebook to be connecting people across the world in communities, and that was the raison d'etre behind Facebook itself. So how do uh, social media sites help in terms of loneliness? So social media or social networking sites help us stay connected in the online world. And according to Vardra and Kuring, they, they help satisfy us in two ways. They help satisfy our need to belong, so our desire to belong to a community. And they help us avoid that feeling or that peril, we might say, of being not part of something. So they allow us to feel we're part of something and not excluded, not ignored. So I wanted to pick up on that one word, need to belong, here. So in terms of need to belong, um, need to belong is a term that was uh, initially coined by Baumeister and Leary back in the 1990s as being the drive we have within us to maintain a certain level of quality uh, and quantity of lasting, positive, significant interpersonal relationships. Now, if you think about that, that's probably going to differ quite a lot for different people. You can probably think about people that have high need to belong yourselves, you know, like the party people that always need to be in a crowd, they need to be around people, versus people who are just really happy in their own company and often don't go out that much and don't sort of interconnect with other people as much. And I'm going to take a stray away a minute, <laughs> just from the topic that I started with, just to talk about measures of belongingness, because I think they bear uh, time to put some scrutiny on them. So need to belong is often used as a measure uh, when we're talking about research into belonging. You know, what are people's need to belong, does it improve, etc. But I think there are some other measures that we should also talk about too, which are equally important. Now. Just briefly, I should say that Need to Belong does predict use of Facebook, so online media is definitely higher used in people that have higher Need to Belong. So there's clearly a connection that people are seeing um, social media and social networking sites as an opportunity to improve belonging. But before I get on to a little bit more detail of that, um, I wanted to just review very quickly some of the manipulations and some of the measures we use when we're measuring loneliness, when we're measuring ostracism and belonging. Now, ostracism and loneliness are not obviously the same thing. Uh, they're different types of measures of feeling excluded, maybe not feeling part of something. But we're not necessarily going to say they're on a linear sort of scale from belongingness. So I think that would be wrong to assume that. So we've got some standard measures that are pretty commonly used. So for example, the UCLA loneliness scale has been well used over many, many years to measure loneliness. Um, but we also have another measure that I think should, deserves using more, which is thwarted belongingness. So I like to measure thwarted belongingness um, as much as need to belong, for this reason that it measures exactly that. So you can have somebody that's really quiet, not hugely social, and has low need to belong, who's very satisfied with their amount of belongingness that they have. And you can have somebody who's, you know, maybe seeing people twice as much as that, but has high need to belong and is not satisfied with the amount of belonging they're getting. Thwarted belongingness, on the other hand, measures how much people feel satisfied with the amount of belonging they're getting. So in other words, do they have enough to sustain them with their individual needs for what they have for belonging, or you know, not? Do they have thwarted belonging that says my belongingness needs essentially aren't being met? So a lot of research looking at belonging uh, stems from research looking at ostracism. That's actually how I first got into belonging, uh, was I was doing some research on ostracism, and one of my measures was a belonging measure, and I noticed really interesting things happening in my belonging measure, and of course, you know, serendipity being what it is, I got kind of curious, and I wanted to see what was happening with belonging, and it took me in a totally different path. 
Um, but um, there are various measures that are used as the opposite to belonging, and I would argue shouldn't necessarily be seen as the opposite, and a lot of them are around ostracism and exclusion. So one of these measures, and the reason I'm going over it is because I think, although they're used interchangeably, they shouldn't be, and I think they give us glimpses into some extra understanding of belonging and loneliness by appreciating the differences in how the measures actually work. So one of them is this idea that nobody wants to work with you. This is a measure that's often used when participants come in, they're told they're going to be doing a task in the research lab, and they're told they're going to be doing it with other people, and then when they get in, if they're in the ostracism condition, they're told, oh, it looked like everybody read your blurb, your profile, and decided nobody wanted to belong in the group with you, so you'll just be working on your own. Okay. They're brutal, by the way. <laughs> These manipulations are so brutal. So we always have lots of candy when we're doing this sort of research <laughs> to make people feel better. So um, you're told basically you're working on your own because nobody wants to work with you. Now, I've actually never used that measure. <laughs> For me, that sounds really brutal. But um, I've used one quite like it. But I would imagine that one would work quite well for making you feel very socially excluded. Um, another one, though, which was developed by Kit Williams, uh, is uh, called Cyberball. And this one's quite a neat one, because this one gives you graduations of measuring how much people feel like they're belonging and how much alone they feel. And I love this one. I think it's really conceptually very elegant. So for anyone not familiar with Cyberball, I don't know if you are. No. So the Cyberball Ball Toss basically is an online um, sort of game that you play and you're brought in to play this game and you're told you're going to be interacting with two other participants. So there's three participants in the game. Uh, in fact, the other two are computer generated. And they're computer generated uh, with the idea that um, they're going to manipulate how much belongingness you get in the game. So because there's three people in the game, you and two other people, um, you either receive the ball um, none of the time, which is the severe exclusion. So in other words, they're, they're throwing the ball back and forth. You're told you're going to be throwing it, but nobody ever throws it to you. So you're totally excluded. Then they have the mild exclusion, where you're throwing it less than a third of the time. So you kind of feel like you're not kind of quite fitting in, but you're not kind of totally excluded either. Then they have the neutral condition, which they used to call the included condition. I'm very relieved they now seem to regard it as a sort of control condition. We get thrown it a third of the time, so none is normal. And then, and this is not always that they have this condition, but many of them do, they have the belonging or included condition. We get thrown it more than a third of the time. And participants, not surprisingly on manipulation checks, report feeling really good in this condition because you know they feel like the chosen one and one that's really liked at the party. Okay, so on top of those measures, um, and I think those two are probably pretty successful, we also have a future life prediction. This one again was highly recommended to me by a researcher many years ago, and I've had very good results with it in that in all conditions it seems to work very, very well um, as a manipulation. And this one tells you that you'll get a future life prediction that will either be, you basically have to do some filler tasks asking about, you know, some very scales about you as well as a kind of, you know, a subterfuge for the actual prediction. But then you're told that you're going to either have a life full of belonging with lots of friends, you know, you'll marry somebody, you'll end up in a significant relation with somebody that's very, very happy, you'll be loved all your life, even in your old age. That's the belonging one. Uh, the neutral is uh, actually you don't get a prediction and you're not expecting one. And then the loneliness or exclusion one, which again, as I said, some of these are pretty harsh, tells you you're going to be able to have a really bad time making social connections through your whole life. You're going to struggle to make friends. When you do make friends, they'll leave you. Uh, if you end up in a partnership with somebody there, it's unlikely to be long lasting and you're going to basically die on your own. <laughs> So that one works really well, <laughs> that manipulation, by the way. Never had any, uh, when I've done manipulation checks, people very clearly feel pretty really positive about the belonging one, really negative about the um, exclusion one. So the last one, which again has been used a lot, is a writing task. And the reason I bring this up is because I think 
Understanding how these measures work consistently or not is actually key to understanding some of the problems that come with our understanding and our conceptualization of, of loneliness and belonging. So the writing task um, is essentially, well actually I can bring this one up. So um, I've used this one too, and it's a memory kind of writing task. So essentially what happens is you're told to remember a time when you really belonged or a time when you really felt excluded or lonely, okay? And you're told to write about it. Now, I've used this twice in studies and not had the same result as the other, the other uh, exclusion manipulations. And I think that's quite important because I think two things happen with this writing task um, that directly sort of relate to what I'm going to talk to you about in terms of social media in a minute. So with this writing task, I think for people that generally have good kind of social connections, this often creates the right effect, which is what they're intending it for, and it makes people relive those jolly times of being socially connected and uh, feel really good and included. Um, but for people who maybe have tenuous social connection, I know from my manipulation check, short answer, that, you know, open-ended questions, that people report that oftentimes with this writing task, they, it reminds them of how they either used to feel belonging, but they don't anymore, which makes very salient the fact that they feel lonely now. Or they say they realize when reading, you know, and thinking about writing a task when they, you know, really belonged, um, as per the instructions, that actually they've never belonged and they've never felt a strong sense of belonging. So what you've got is a manipulation that in theory is meant to be in this research making people feel a strong sense of belonging. But with some people it is, and with other people I think it's really not. It's actually making, it's doing the opposite. It's making them feel like they are more lonely than they were before they did the task. Okay, so why does all that matter? Um, well, it matters because of the way we understand our use of some of the alternatives to human face-to-face -face interaction um, at, in terms of you know, using social media and using animals. So there is no doubt that there are some big pluses behind using social media to increase feelings of connection. Uh, research shows it's well correlated, positively correlated with uh, feelings of well-being. So, for example, this study by Grieve, uh, Indian colleagues actually looked at uh, social networking sites and specifically they looked at Facebook and they found there was lots of evidence to support the idea that Facebook helped people not only maintain existing connections but also develop new ones and that it was associated with, you know, lower feelings of depression, lower concerns about life satisfaction. They also found that it acted as a separate channel, if you like, a separate medium to develop and maintain relationships that could be an alternative to the relationships you only had face to face. So in other words, you had some crossover of people that maybe you did both with and then you had some where it was just all online versus all in person. Okay, so good news there. Um, then in terms of other research, um, Vaudra and Schneider, who's done a lot of research on social media and connection, social belonging, uh, also found it could be very, very positive and easy. In other words, that convenience of being online to make friends. Okay, so their research particularly found that social networking sites offered a sense of belongingness opportunities, but, and here's the thing, so Vaudra and Schneider look at social media very critically. Um, in terms of their assessment of how much it helps with loneliness or not. So they also highlighted uh, the fear of missing out opportunities that social media also offers, I don't know, raises, um, and potentially um, excessive seeking of reassurance. So I'm going to talk a little, little bit more about this in a moment. Okay, but still on the positive side then, some other positives. So. We don't all live close to each other, do we? We often have to um, admit we've moved away from loved ones. So I'm from the UK and I'm a million miles away from some of my oldest friends and I, I communicate online with them now. 
So Cummings and colleagues uh, did a really good job of establishing the positives of social networking sites and social media to help us keep connected. So for example, they said when people moved to university, um, if they moved away from home to go to university, this was a really good buffering effect of being able to still connect their old friends back home while they established new relationships with people in that sort of interim phase. And as we all know, if we have parents or friends who live elsewhere, it helps us stay in touch with them. Um, it can also act to help maintain social capital. So in other words, if we feel like maybe we don't have an, as many in-person friends as we'd like, it kind of gives us a sense that, yeah, we have this big battalion of online friends too that makes us feel like, yeah, we've got, we've got resilience here in terms of social belonging. Um, and it also improves self-esteem and life satisfaction according to two different studies. Okay, so here's the, the fun one though, to my mind anyway. So Gardner, Pickett and Knowles did quite a lot of work into social belonging and one of the things they highlighted that I think would apply very much to social media is this idea of social snacking. Okay, so let me get a diagram up so it's easier to talk about the diagram. So this is a diagram that's actually originally developed um, as a model by Leary and colleagues, a sociometer model. So you'll see here, and they, they adapted it um, to talk about social snacking. So the idea is that we're, we're socially monitoring as kind of very you know, connected individuals. We want to be in touch with people. So we're often looking for opportunities to socially connect with others. If our, our connections are satisfactory, going up to the top, we, we just kind of keep monitoring our current state of belonging and we're happy with that. If the answer is no, though, then we go the, the kind of right-hand route here and attempt to reconnect with people through social interaction, typically in person. However, in the times when that's not possible, then we have to find some alternatives. And that's where we get down into this area of social shielding and social snacking. So what does social shielding and social snacking mean? So according to uh, the research, social snacking is essentially using reminders of social bonds that we already have. So in other words, photographs of loved ones, photographs of us with loved ones, letters from them, and of course translating all that online. You know, emails, rereading emails, looking at images of us with other people online. So the idea here is that that will reaffirm bonds and it will act as a kind of snack until the next time we can have our proper meal of, you know, seeing the person in person. Okay, social shielding on the other hand is also interesting because this is the idea that we would use non-human objects to provide social comfort in some way. When I say non-human, I mean non-in-person human objects. So, for example, we may, you know, chat away to our houseplants. You know, or we may chat away to TV personalities. So this is what we mean by parasocial, is when we start to form relationships in our minds with maybe, you know, personalities on TV, YouTubers, and we feel like they're our friends that we can talk to and interact with. Okay, so that's where we see social shielding used. Okay, so some more positives um, are around nostalgia. And this is where I think it gets interesting because of what I was saying about reminders of belonging. So we've often found that um, people turn to nostalgia when they're feeling lonely. And we also know that the, some of the reason behind that is because nostalgia helps regulate loneliness by making us feel that you know, we once did have social support, we'll have it again in the future. And on the positive side, it seems to act as a kind of prompt to encourage us to go back out there into the world and engage in social interaction if we're feeling um, nostalgia or because we're feeling lonely. Okay, so in other words, nostalgia may be a resource that helps protect us um, and improve our resilience, improve our mental health, but also encourages us to go out there and reseek social connections that have been good for us in the past and uh, offset sort of feelings of loneliness. Okay, so um, one last couple of points about social media potential positives are um, quite a lot of research at the moment going into connection apps. So this is a new line of inquiry, and there's a, um, I'll talk about both of these in a moment, new line of sort of research looking into whether rather than just sort of 
go online to appease loneliness, whether we could use specific apps that are designed to not to have the downsides of some of the social media stuff which I'm about to talk about, but also really just aimed at creating all the positives about feeling belonging in an online easy to use app. So a couple of studies here have looked at and found relatively positive initial findings from connection apps that they've created for the research studies of way to kind of encourage people to feel more connected and offset uh, the first sort of moments of loneliness. Another one which I really like is the virtual care farm app. So this one is like, you know, Sims or something, it's like a virtual world, but it encourages you to look after things, like so a farm where you have to do animal husbandry and you go online, and it's designed that you will meet friends and family there. So for example, people talk about sitting down in the fields and sitting with their mum who is somewhere else and watching the sun go up over the farm together. You know, it's a way to connect. It's almost like going for a walk with a friend and it's all virtual. Or you're saying, I did the chickens today, you don't need to. And things like this as you share it with people that you know. So I thought it was very interesting because it combines that kind of nurturing that we know is actually quite good for feelings of um, loneliness, plus it connects you too. Okay, so you knew I was going to get on to the negative. So, <laughs> um, social media ha is this, for sure, this double-edged sword. So it has what we call um, possibilities for approach, but also these possibilities for avoid and increased isolation. Okay, so this research by Arn and Shin uh, found that um, social media could be very positive when it provided opportunities such as connectedness. But it could be very problematic if we started to use it to displace face-to-face -face interactions. So in other words, if you start spending more time online, and that's offset by spending less time in person, and then it builds and you start avoiding the in-person time because it's easier to be online or there's other reasons you want to be online, it's going to have negative impacts on your well-being. Okay, so we find essentially in overviews that social media uh, can be, the good side can be undermined by the negative side effects, okay? So, um, for example, um, Cross's study uh, looked at subjective well-being uh, in the moment and also how satisfied people were longer term with their lives. And this was a nice study because it was very controlled, really nicely set up, and they found that the results, and this, it was longitudinal, uh, were that people who used Facebook a lot, in other words, they had people in a lot of different conditions using it a little bit, using it a lot, and they found the more people used Facebook, uh, the less uh, they felt well-being in the, the short term, but also the more their life satisfaction levels decreased. So there's clearly a problem with excessive use of these social networks. Now, the other things are things like like buttons. When we get lots of likes from doing something, fantastic. But when we get lots of unlikes or lots of unfriending, <laughs> you know, this is really awful compared to, say, what might happen on a more subtle level in person. You know, it's rare nowadays in person that we get heavy-duty ostracism <laughs> of the kind that we might get when somebody unfriends us or unlikes us on a button. Okay, whoops, sorry. There we are. So we've got a whole range of research looking at essentially eye disorders uh, revolving around excessive social comparison. You can see, oh, you know, the fear of missing out, they're doing so much more than me, you know, they're having so much better life than me, etc. And also severe reactions to ostracism online and offline. Okay, so coming back to these extreme experiences of fear of missing out. So you see all the things that people are doing. If you're in the pictures, obviously that's going to make you feel great. Uh, but if you're not, then you start to get even more worried that you're missing out on what everybody else is doing and what fun everybody else is doing. And two research studies have looked at this finding that this tends to create this more different, different uh, efficiency orientated need approach to social media so people start getting more excessive in terms of the reassurance seeking and the less reassurance they get obviously the more they seek it. Okay so not surprisingly a few more statistics 73% uh, of very heavy social media users feel lonely 
Uh, social media use is associated with increased loneliness, and the research shows that if it is used to escape social interaction in person, it's actually going to have the further negative um, effect is actually going to increase loneliness. Now, as a little end to that, uh, Dr. Lonely, as he used to be known, John Cacchiopo, who really is the preeminent person in terms of research on loneliness, uh, now no longer with us, uh, suggested that engaging in computer-aided relationships to satisfy feelings of connection was a bit like starving people eating celery. Better than nothing at all, but it's not really going to create long-term sustenance, which very much comes back to that idea of Pigs and Gardner about social snacking. So in other words, might keep you going in the short term, not necessarily a long-term solution. Okay, so this is my subject area, and I don't know why I put so much short, short part of this into my subject area, but um, um, I'm all about um, animals and humans particularly, and the research I've done on social media is partly in connection with my loneliness research and my research on animals and different ways to beat loneliness. So animals and nature have huge anecdotal kind of uh, evidence for helping with feelings of loneliness, helping with feelings of belonging. Um, so, for example, we see a lot of what we call human-animal interaction research, uh, which is very, very positive about the beneficial impacts. I mean, it's, I'll, be, I'll be quite blunt with you. A lot of it is done by organisations that have a vested interest in finding positive effects. So, Habri, which is the Human-Animal Bond Research Institute in the US, uh, have a huge amount of funding uh, for research and uh, almost all their research shows how wonderful the human-animal interaction bond is. So it's a bit like Walnut Association of the US doing research to show how good walnuts are in a way. It's kind of, it's not as objective as we'd like it to be, let us say. And there's quite a few people involved in the uh, area, which is anthrozoology for anyone interested, uh, which is uh, human-animal interaction research. Uh, it's called anthrozoology. Um, so quite a lot of us involved in anthrozoology who, who very much campaign for more rigorous studies. So, still, anecdotally, we have a lot of evidence to suggest that human-animal interaction is good for us, for our well-being. Um, we also use animal-assisted therapy often. So I've been part of studies bringing animals into universities um, to help with the stress of midterms and all this thing. Um, they're also used for obviously helping war veterans, we see horses used a lot, people suffering from PTSD and other traumas, um, so they're widely used. Uh, plus also um, spending time in nature has a, a fairly broad uh, body of research as well saying how beneficial it is for subjective well-being. So I think all of these stem from an idea that was comes back from the 1980s. Uh, which uh, is the biophilia hypothesis. So for anyone not familiar with the bio <laughs> biophilia hypothesis, this is the idea that we have a drive as human beings to connect with nature, to be with other animals, to be with nature, that's one of our basic drives. Be it a, the reasoning behind it perhaps because we feel part of our ecosystems on some evolutionary uh, manner or because we need to understand animals because they may jump on us and eat us if we don't understand them or whatever. You know, but the, essentially we need to feel connected within the natural world. And I think that has driven this hypothesis. Uh, actually, Ed, Edward O. Wilson's a really interesting guy because he did tons of research on social insects. That was his big thing initially before he came up with the biophilic hypothesis. Uh, a hypothesis was that he researched social insects and ants. Uh, really, really interesting books on that, by the way, if you're interested in sort of social psychology, uh, read his books on ants. Anyhow, so we've got a big body of um, anecdotal evidence to suggest that there's a lot of positives between human animal interaction. Um, so, for sure, there's huge reviews out there looking at all sorts of variants on animals and nature and the positive impacts. So for example, connecting with nature um, is widely found to seem to um, be good for subjective well-being and improved well-being. 
Um, also, uh, research shows that living close to nature is a predictor of loneliness scores in that if you live a long way away from nature, you feel more lonely. If you live close to nature, you feel less lonely. Although it doesn't seem to be so much the times you spend in nature as just being able to access it and have it there. Um, some also some positives on the animal side then. So pet keeping is connected to a variety of different health and psychological benefits, uh, supposedly. And by the way, the second author, James Serple, has spent his whole life uh, researching human-animal connections and the benefits or not of human-animal connections um, and um, you know, has written countless books on the subject and definitely um, a, an amazing researcher to talk to. Um, other researchers looked at animal um, assisted therapy, for example in nursing homes, found that it improves reports and their self reports of loneliness. And um, animal interactions seem to keep going ticks in terms of having positive health benefits, improving a variety of you know, physical health benefits as well as perceptions of health and loneliness. All sounds great. Now, what's the problem with this? The problem with this, and I've got some more here. Um, the problem with this is that a lot of it has struggled to have good rigorous design in this research. Now some of it you can understand why, because it's very hard to do a placebo um, when you've got an animal. You know? um, it's, it's quite hard to kind of come up with elegant designs that really uh, withstand sort of rigor and randomized control trials because you can't give somebody a pet and then take it away again and things like this. So um, it, it's problematic research to, to do some of the rigorous research that you experimental research you'd want to do on anyway. But a lot of the findings, such as this one by Kraus and Varela, who does research for Hadbury, are very much kind of slanted towards the expectation of finding positive effects between uh, you know, human and animal interactions. So um, there is a big criticism, and I'm not the only one in the field criticizing uh, studies that are, are, are walking in there with an expectation of finding a positive um, connection, correlation, or effect. Um, so there's still, you know, there's still quite a lot of studies that are positive. Now this one I found interesting because this was one uh, from last year, again by Kit Williams, who does a lot of work on loneliness and ostracism. And he found, and I thought it tied it together a bit in a way, but he found positives during COVID of, um, you know, doing things such as uh, video conferencing, being online, but also interacting with robotic pets. I'm going to come back to this one in a moment, robotic pets. Okay, so, well, I'm actually going to come back to it now. So, um, I want to talk very briefly about anthropomorphism. I know I'm throwing lots of terms at you here, but it's a bit of a smorgasbord of research in this area. So, anthropomorphism, for anyone who's not aware of what the terminology means, so anthropomorphism is the treatment of non-humans, and that could be animals or it could be objects, as human-like. Now, in this particular... Um, uh, definition by uh, Nick Epley and Adam Waits and John Kakiopo, um, they say to attain social connection. This is actually because they did a piece of research looking at motivation to anthropomorphize. So why do we see faces in clouds? Why do we think, you know, car shapes look like humans? Or why do we kind of anthropomorphize animals and have cute, like, kind of cartoon characters that are half human, um, half kind of animal? Um, so they did um, a big body of research, really interesting, out of um, Chicago, actually um, looking at why we anthropomorphize. And they pinned it down to three dimensions. So the first two, I think, often go together, which is to learn about and predict behavior. And I think that's been solidly proven across many studies now, that it's all about understanding. So effectance motivation, essentially, you know, we can't work out why our computer isn't working. So if we shout at it like it's a human, or if we treat it like a human, maybe we'll be able to work out why it's not working. So in other words, predicting behavior, or, you know, we don't know why our dog's behaving as he does, so if we imagine he's a human, we can kind of try and see into why he's doing what he's doing. So that's the first two, predicting behavior and understanding better. But the second big one they found was desire to socially connect. So we actually, I've done research on this, we actually anthropomorphize more when we're lonely. 
Okay, so we actually go out there and we find more non-human things that we start treating as like kind of honorary humans, as I say, when we are lonely. Okay, so um, we find a variety of different studies supporting this, including anthropomorphic uh, robot animals seem to actually serve as many benefits as real animals. So again, we start to wonder, so we're anthropomorphizing more because we're lonely, we're creating these mini-humans, we're seeing mini-humans in animals, and we're also seeing kind of mini-humans or honorary humans, um, even in robot animals. And in fact, actually, there's a huge area of research looking at anthropomorphism specifically in robots at the moment, which is very interesting. Okay, so coming back to animals and nature, a few of the positives then. So, some people definitely find animals actually, they say, more emotionally supportive than humans. Uh, a lot of the research seems to suggest that that is because um, people sometimes find it hard to talk to humans without being judged or without feeling maybe, you know, criticised. And they may find animals obviously less judgmental, they're not going to sit there and say, I told you you shouldn't do that. They're going to be happy and friendly and whatever. Um, we also know that people who feel rejected, so for example homeless youth, also report pet companions are very important to them in terms of lo uh, loneliness, reducing loneliness, um, when they feel ostracised by society, in other words. So they seek you know, the comfort of animals in the face of human ostracism. Okay, so we also know that animal interactions have a positive impact on student well-being. So this particular study looked at the Student Counselling Centre, found lots of sort of self-report. And again, we always have to be a bit careful because a lot of these measures are self-report. Um, so, you know, people don't always know what they're feeling. But they found um, self-reports of reduced anxiety and loneliness scores when people came to animal assisted intervention events on campus. And I've been doing them at a variety of different universities. I have colleagues who do them at UC Okanagan. They run a BART program where they have uh, dogs on campus all the time, basically five days a week, uh, for students to interact with. And a colleague of mine does research on uh, actually academic retention because of uh, having that as a resource. Okay, so there's loads of positives, both anecdotally and real positives, where people really seem to get benefit from animals. But again, like social media, it can have problems. So this research by McCurry um, is backed up by other research um, that I've seen that talks about the problems connected to owning animals, so domestic animals, we're talking primarily here. Um, so, for example, um, people talk about not going out as much as they used to because they have to be home for the dog. Or walking with the dog and then not being able to go and have a cup of tea with a friend because they can't leave the dog outside. Or curtailing some of their social activities with humans because of their pet. Okay, so this is often underestimated as a negative side effect of having what we call companion animals, which obviously by the term, suggests that they're meant to be companions. So we've got two bodies of research essentially that raise a question mark about the positives of animals, nature and human interactions. Uh, so the one side is, what about the negatives of owning animals? What about the negatives of interacting? What about when your pet dies and it's awful, or when your pet gets old and they get very infirm and you have to look after them, which obviously happens cyclically much more often than with humans. The other body of research looks at um, whether any of these, this research on human-animal bond and the wonderfulness about it actually has validity because they're not very well kind of controlled in terms of experimental design. So Buckle did a great piece of research um, assessing animal visits uh, with loneliness measures in a randomized control trial and found absolutely zero effect. Um, when it was really um, a nice lockdown study. Okay, so on the side of burdens to them, um, we also find research suggesting that people become over-reliant on their pet. And then this sometimes results in them withdrawing a little bit more from human interaction and that having a negative effect in terms of people feeling a bit rejected uh, from humans. 
And we have more and more reviews coming out to show that the positive uh, studies we saw, showing that companion animals um, reduce loneliness, actually uh, don't really stand up to scrutiny from an experimental design perspective. Okay, now this lovely piece of research that one of my colleagues came um, up with, he was actually uh, an external examiner on this piece of research, um, probably gets at some of it, because what they found um, with this research is that pet ownership seemed to have short-term effects on experiences of well-being. So it made pet owners feel good in the moment, okay, but not very much long-term uh, life satisfaction effect. So it's perhaps this that's giving us uh, this kind of mixed message about how good animals are for us, and we can come back again to this idea of social snacking, but perhaps in the short term, they're a great solution, but as a long-term proper gap against you know, having human companionship, maybe not. So Hal Herzog, who's a uh, quick plug for his book, he's written you know, those we love, some we love, some we hate, and some we eat, a great book, and a great guy, um, has um, basically suggesting that some of the discrepancy between what we have, this huge body of owner reports, and I've got a dog, I love my dog, and my dog makes me feel wonderful, um, but you know, does he really make me feel less lonely or not? That's the big thing. While owners may say, yes, your pets make you feel less lonely, the reality is there's not a lot of evidence to say they really do make you feel less lonely, sadly. So although we've got 80% of pet owners saying their pets make them feel less lonely, analysis of studies finds very little evidence that actually pet owners are less lonely. And most importantly, if you analyze the more recent studies that tend to be more rigorous, you see less evidence in the more recent studies as well. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, a little bit downbeat really. Um, so on the plus side then, um, other measures, other ways that we can reduce loneliness. Um, obviously, younger populations are of interest. So a lot of interventions have been done recently in research looking at what works better with younger populations. Uh, the research comes back to support the idea that quality of friendship is much, much more important than quantity. So, you know, 50 friends on Facebook mean nothing compared to two good friends that are really meaningful. Also, um, lots of meta-analyses done um, evaluating the different types of invention, interventions that have uh, dealt specifically with youth, looking to see uh, what works, what doesn't work. Some successes, so it's definitely some interventions work. The ones that seem to work the best are the ones that are the most intensive. So these are typically face-to-face, -face, meeting frequently in very cohesive groups that you know, you're very supportive in. On the downside, of course, that's quite onerous in terms of commitment, uh, both of the people engaging, but also in terms of public resources to create these. Um, also, other interventions involving technology uh, seem to be working, so that might tie back to those connect apps and things like virtual farms that also might bring people, if they're specifically designed to combat loneliness, because Facebook is not specifically designed to combat loneliness, and of course it has potentially big negative side effects if it's not well used. Uh, general interventions then. So these are more interventions that have looked at ways to combat what I would say would be um, chronic loneliness. So people who've really got set in loneliness, that they're feeling now they're very much finding it hard to connect um, with people on a general level. So Zadric did a big meta-analysis of different types of event interventions to, to, to connect people with chronic loneliness and found that a lot of them uh, that were more successful uh, had to address this kind of hypervigilance for social threats. So when people feel excluded, uh, they may react by kind of pulling more into their shell rather than jumping back out there and you know saying, I'm going to try again, I don't care. Um, so interventions are most likely to work if they give people sort of the toolkits to maintain connectedness, but also to get out there and not feel that they have to retreat. And often interventions using CBT techniques are very good for people with chronic loneliness because they help break cycles. Uh, they're actually very negative. So another research, uh, meta-analysis, um, which included Kakiopo, um, in fact both of these did, 
Um, so obviously, um, probably a very uh, rigorous analysis. This uh, found four main intervention strategies, which they said for chronic loneliness, the last one, so addressing maladaptive social connection, um, showed the most evidence of success. So just briefly, um, this comes back to a model that uh, Kakiopo um, developed um, with other researchers, looking at people that become chronically lonely and then uh, get into an isolation cycle where they find it very hard to actually motivate to connect again and they get into a sort of negative feedback loop of withdrawing more and more. And the interventions that deal with this, that actually try and teach people techniques to maybe not perceive loneliness and ostracism in the way that they might not to negatively react, not to get sucked into a sort of cycle of, of negative behaviour, are the ones that are most useful. Okay, so we come back to our traditional methods of beating loneliness. Now, all of these methods have merit, okay? But I'm going to quickly touch on the last two. So volunteering. Volunteering um, has been found in quite a lot of studies to really help with loneliness. So one study looked at volunteering with people that have been recently bereaved, not old people per se, but a wide range of people in the study, and found that volunteering was very successful in combating feelings of loneliness in this situation. Um, another study looked at older people and loneliness, uh, but this study found that um, volunteering didn't really have an impact if you felt that you were doing fine. In other words, maybe you're topped up enough in terms of your belonging, and then volunteering, if you're feeling okay about yourself, doesn't actually kind of make you feel super belonging, it just kind of doesn't really have an effect at all. Um, and then vol volunteering, two studies here saying that uh, volunteering has positive impacts both in terms of higher well-being in general but also the second study uh, was a nice uh, experimental design and they looked at change in well-being so they looked at uh, over a time period um, people who were in two different conditions whether the volunteering helped um, improve their well-being and found that it did. And then the last thing um, just to mention is some fantastic research that came out um, just this year uh, looking at diversity of social portfolios, which I think is a really important one um, when you're thinking about just general sort of low-level loneliness. So um, actually having a wide range of connections is very important. And we're talking about even incidental connections. So we're thinking, you know, do you say hello to somebody when you're at the bus stop? Do you, you know, smile and chat to somebody at the bank teller or, you know, the supermarket checkout? These little incidental connections that we have on a day-to-day -day level are very important and actually tend to be a higher predictor of uh, subjective well-being than even just being married and in a partnership. Okay, so in other words, don't discount these small interactions with people um, as, as lifting your general level of feeling socially connected. Okay, other research that somewhat corroborates this uh, has found correlation between loneliness and unemployment. So in other words, if you're not out there doing your job, seeing people, chatting to people, etc., uh, then you're going to feel more lonely. If you're in a job of employment or even if you're volunteering, you're getting out, you're meeting people, you're working in the community, this is going to um, definitely improve uh, your feelings of social connection and reduce loneliness. Okay, so that's about it. The footnotes um, are here. I will just whiz through them super quickly um, because obviously there's lots, but you can always contact me uh, for all the many, many references that we've gone through and I'd be very, very happy to share these references with you. And I'd like to say, um, I should actually say a big thank you to Hal Herzog, uh, a colleague of mine who helped me with some of this because um, he's recently been poking around in some of the research work um, looking at uh, the negatives of um, some of the things like social media and animal interaction and loneliness. Well, so, so pretty much to time. I went on a little bit longer. Hey, perfect, perfect. Okay, so it's time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I can start us off. Questions are always scary, but I love them. Okay, so one thing I just want to go back to was yes, the idea tell that... Yes, me to get back to the slide. Uh, we don't go back. It's just more so the idea is that when someone has a, uh, an animal, it, their loneliness goes down at the beginning, but on long term it 
it doesn't do anything, correct? Not quite. Not so quite. they perceive, they have higher perceptions of here in the present sense of being connected and um, well-being. Mm -hmm. But on a kind of long-term level, we don't see any difference in their social connection. The solution to that is we do a rent-a-pet business scheme, and then that's how we make money. But that's a different thing. And then my, my next question is... Um, and the reason for that, I think the reason that's interesting, and I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's the concrete. But the reason I think that's pretty interesting is it kind of feeds into what we know about pet owners and people who have companion animals who are absolutely adamant that these pets make them feel better. Um, it seems in the moment they absolutely make them feel better, but it's not like it's long-term sustenance. It doesn't seem to pan out to make them feel better on a more holistic level. Can age be a moderator of that, though? I have not seen any research that has suggested age moderates that. Graduate study. Woo! I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, thinking of my, my grandma, for yes. instance, who was like, had a, always had a dog, and it was like a huge part of her life. And then I think of my children, who are teenagers, and they like barely take a second oh. look at the animals. Yeah, so, no, that has been changed. So the investment that you have in your animal um, is definitely a compound. So, you know, not just owning a pet, and this is a problem with some of the studies, is they don't check how invested you are or your relate the quality of your relationship with your pet. So it's hard to come to conclusions because, as you say, you might have a pet that you just don't even look at, in the case of kids or whatever, or you might have a pet that you, it's your bee's knees, it's your everything, you come home, you can't wait to see your pet. So, yes, that, that is absolutely a moderator, your involvement with your companion animal. But when I say age, um, I have looked at age quite a lot, and age is definitely connected to um, the negative impacts of pet ownership heavily. So as you get older, um, your pet you often end up with older pets. Your pet's uh, health, you know, kicks off all sorts of concerns in your own mind and your well-being about your health. It creates worries, it creates a lot of concerns, and it causes you to pull back from other people. Sometimes people who've got dogs, I have a friend who's got a very difficult crusty dog, and she's an older lady, and she doesn't get out much, so people have to come to her house, and the dog tries to bite people all the time. And she feels awkward about this, so sometimes she tries to put the dog in the other room, and then sometimes the dog just barks and barks and barks from the other room, and then she feels uncomfortable, and the people leave. And so this has put her now in a cycle that is very common of not seeing her friends as much because of this darn crusty dog that she's got. And that is not uncommon. So Hal can tell you a billion and one stories along those lines. He did a huge chunk of research looking at it a few years back. And um, he actually did a conference talk on how he thought pets were generally de detrimental for our health because of this, because they caused more problems than they solved. <laughs> but he, I don't know, it wasn't, you know, uh, an experimental design research study by any means. It was more like just a general kind of viewpoint. But you, your second question. Oh, Brandon. yes, my second question, fantastic, is uh, it's just more of your personal experience. And, you know, you say animals, so it includes everything. But what's an animal you just, researchers just, don't like working with when measuring loneliness? Like, is there like, you know, everyone's like, oh, everyone has a dog or cat, but is there one type of animal you're like, just don't deal with it? Ah, so I've done quite a lot of research on different animals because I came from a natural history background, so I've spent a lot of time with wild animals too, and I've um, done research looking at charismatic megafauna and, you know, what is the most charismatic animal? And of course, I could talk about an hour of this, but um, there are certain animals that, you know, aren't very human-like, <laughs> tying back into the anthropomorphism, that we really don't tend to warm to. So don't tend to warm to insects, although there was a great program that came out on um, uh, earwigs. So nobody like, loves it. Everybody goes, ooh, 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 you know. But um, it was a beautiful program on earwigs, and it showed how earwig mothers are really, really maternal, and they bring up their babies, and they go backwards and forwards feeding them, and this sort of thing. And suddenly everyone's like, oh, because they're like humans then, because they're actually nurturing, like we nurture our children. So we have, you know, definitely a big reaction to different animals. The ones that are the most human-like, you know, are the ones that we feel the most warmth to because we just want them to be honoring humans, really. Um, so, for example, if you look at scales of how people uh, evaluate how much they like animals, 
Um, you'll see on the whole insects down here, reptiles down here, birds around here, except penguins that stand on their feet and look like people, become ordinary people up here, so all the other birds are down here. Um, and this is where it tells you, you get these cues of, you know, what is it about an animal that, that makes them acceptable? And then you go through this weird kind of middle path of the dangerous animals that just have charisma for their own sake, like sharks and, and tigers and alligators and things um, that tend to be much loved by kind of men in their sort of 20s to 30s age range. If you ever go to a herp sort of uh, herpetological kind of place, you'll find, you know, lots of guys with sort of snakes and things like this. Um, anyway, and then you get up to the fluffy, furry ones, like teddy bear type animals, etc. So yeah, I mean, typically what we try and do is stick with the same animal. So in other words, because we're trying to research other things, we'll typically not vary the animal. If you vary the animal, it's a horrific compound in terms of trying to get the responses back. So unless you're specifically doing research that's looking at which animal gets liked better than another one, you'll stick with whatever you pick. And dogs do fairly well, cats do fairly well, bunnies do well. So for example, another uh, animal intervention in universities is often bunny yoga. That's very popular. You, you do yoga and the bunnies hop around, sometimes they hop onto you, they're very placid. Uh, that seems to be very successful, everybody likes bunny yoga. So um, bunnies seem to do good. I didn't um, even know that was a thing. No, I'm excited. It's really now, a thing. You got to bring in the KPU. You got to bring yeah, in bunny, bunny yoga. yoga. I've heard it's, of goat yoga. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yes, yeah. I've heard of goat yoga, but I've never seen it. But I said you, you did bunny yoga regularly for quite a few <laughs> years, and it was very popular. Yeah, yeah. And then we had to switch everything off because of COVID, and now we're getting back to it. Yeah. But so I can't quite answer your question. I would say a, a, an animal you wouldn't want to use would be something like earthworms and slugs and spiders and because, you know, that's, that's, and then that gets into dehumanization, which is the flip side of anthropomorphization, where you dehumanize things and you make people into cockroaches and, you know, because, and pests and things that carry desert, disease and stuff like that. So. Thank you. No, that's great. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? Yeah, I'm just curious, do you have any current research going on right now or any plans for research? I have, I am halfway through research looking at personalization with another researcher at the University of Quebec, Montreal. So we were, look, we were doing research, she did a solidarity with animals scale a few years ago. And so we decided to use some of her studies that she didn't use. Uh, to look into um, one of the one of the dimensions of solidarity with animals includes you know whether you see them as similar and per, per, like people. So we started some research um, last year looking at personalization, and um, so in other words, could we if we tried to create a superordinate category, and I suggested persons because she had it in her research already, um, that we tried to convince people that animals would be could be considered persons, because I don't know if you're aware, but it's quite been quite a lot in the news over the last five, ten years, about rivers being given personhood rights and chimpanzees and elephants being lobbied to have personhood rights. So we created uh, manipulation um, to try and manipulate people to think of animals as persons, to see if we get positive, higher positive ratings on various uh, dimensions. And we didn't have success, unfortunately, but I think it was the measure. I think she was helping. Between you and me, she was hell bent on to do the measure, and I wasn't convinced, but she swung it because she said she'd use it very successfully, and it totally didn't work. So, <laughs> not measure manipulation, it totally didn't work. It, it just there was no difference between it, the conditions. So I think um, it sort of fell by the wayside on that one, and I've been quite busy the last year, but we, it's still on the back burner. It's sort of in process, so to speak. That's the only thing I'm doing right now um, with her. I was involved pre-COVID on some research on furries, um, but again, that's on the back burner right now. So furries are people who like to dress up as animals. So um, in Vancouver, Vancouver actually has a big furry convention every year called Vancouver in March. You're nodding? You yeah, I, have, I follow that kind of stuff because uh, there was a huge thing down in Seattle where there yeah. was a furry com uh, convention. convention and it yeah. just went so bad. But that's a different story. Mm. So now it's just when I see it, it's... Yeah, so um, I have a colleague in Australia who researches on furries and we were going to combine some of our research uh, looking at similarity and self-control. 
um, on. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you got to check it's, it out. It's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So probably now I'm kind of more settled again and working, you know, trying to step back on my teaching work a bit. I'll get back more into the whole research side. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? But yes, looking for, yes, quick plug, looking for uh, honours students for next year who are interested in this area and would like to work with me. That would be really cool. We were actually going to do a study where we had real dogs and uh, like soft toy dogs to compare, you know, whether stroking a real dog uh, versus a soft toy dog would uh, have similar effects because we're into, you know, really pushing to see if the effect is to do with the animal as opposed to just say stroking or just, you know, other activities or, you know, there's some research now that's looking at whether it's the dog and the handler and the handler's having the main effect, not the dog, you know, and things like that. So um, separating those is really important. Cool. Thank you again. Yeah.